Okay, everyone, welcome back. Um, I'm glad to see so many people are here for the second talk on our lecture series um, on vanishing theorems of mixed characteristic and applications. And Bhargav Bhatt from the University of Michigan will continue from Monday. Great, uh, thanks. All right, so let me set this up. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna continue from where I left off last week, or last time, I guess, which was Monday. Um, so maybe before I start, I just want to say something I, that I already said before to Carl. But uh, if you have a question, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask me the question because I sort of not I'm not capable of looking at the chat while I give the talk. So yeah, please feel free to ask questions. Okay, so yeah, I want to talk about today. I want to talk about Carrera vanishing and mixed characteristics. So let me just uh, remind you what I did last time in words. So we talked about Carrera vanishing over the complex numbers. Uh, and so the proof there, so I sketched a proof of some aspect of it that uses Hodge theory. And then I talked about this version in Kersig P, which is up to finite covers. So it's not true on the nose, but it was true up to finite covers. Uh, and I explained some of the ideas that go into that. And so what I wanna do today now is talk about the mixed characteristic case, which is the actually uh, relevant case for this lecture series. And so let me uh, uh, adopt the following setup for the rest of the talk, or at least for the first half of the talk. So I, will, I, I, I debated a little bit about how to do this because there's various generalities in which you can state things. And so I'm gonna try and state things in a pretty general context. And then we'll spend some time unwrapping what that means in concrete situations. Um, so R is gonna be an excellent Ethereum domain. Uh, the typical example to have in mind is something like well, it could be a finite field, or it could be a field of Kersic P, or it could be a ring of p adic integers, or finally presented rings over those, and so on, or completions. Um, X is going to be my geometric object. So X over R is a proper uh, integral R scheme. And uh, I will often implicitly be assuming that uh, X to spec R is dominant, so it hits the generic point. Um, just to make my life easier. Um, We're gonna be interested in, usually in the mixed characteristic situation, so stuff that's close to characteristic P. And so I, it's useful to give a name to the characteristic P fiber. So X P equals zero is my notation for uh, what you get when you base change to F P over Z. Right, so if the ring was already of characteristic P, this is not doing anything. And if the ring was of mixed characteristic, like over ZP, then it's reducing mod P. Um, L is gonna be the line bundle. So L and pick X is uh, semi-ample and big. And um, I tried to emphasize this point last time that when you're trying to prove these statements about uh, things that are true up to finite covers, it's often fruitful to pass to the inverse limit over all finite covers and state like an actual vanishing theorem rather than things that say that certain maps vanish. You want to say that some group vanishes. And so I'm gonna try and do that in this talk too. And it's more important in this talk because you only there are certain structures uh, you only see at the infinite level, namely this property of being perfectoid, uh, which will not make sense at finite levels. Um, and so X plus is gonna be uh, the absolute integral closure of X. Uh, so, It's the inverse limit over all finite covers uh, in a fixed algebraic closure of the function field. Okay, so let me again, just write down the definition. So it was the integral closure of X in an algebraic closure of its function field. So there's some ambiguity in talking about the absolute integral closure. It's the same ambiguity that shows up when you try and talk about the algebraic closure of a field. It's only well-defined up to non-unique isomorphism, but that's okay. Um, and so one way to think about X plus is that it's the inverse limit over all finite covers Y to X. So I'll just write it like so without spelling out literally what this is uh, saying. And so what I mean over here is that you fix an algebraic closure KX bar of X, like I did over here, then look at all finite extensions of KX. For each finite extension, uh, you get an, the normalization of X inside there. So you get a finite cover and then you take uh, the inverse limit over all of them. And this is really like an inverse limit in the best possible sense. So it's an inverse limit in the category of locally ring spaces. It's also an inverse limit in the category of schemes. Uh, 
and things behave nicely. And you can sort of talk about invariance of this. So things like coherent cohomology and so on, they behave as you would expect. So the coherent cohomology of X plus is just gonna be the coherent cohomology of the Y's and then you take a direct limit. Um, so it's just, again, it's in some sense, it's a bookkeeping device to talk about all the Y's uh, at once, but at some point it will become an actually uh, intrinsic object to us. Okay, and then uh, the sort of, the Kodara vanishing theorem, uh, I'm gonna formulate it in terms of local algebra. Um, and so I'm gonna introduce these section rings which are basically the coordinate rings of the affine cones. So RXL is the uh, homogeneous coordinate ring of X with coefficients and powers of L, positive powers of L. And likewise, for any scheme that lies over X, I can do the same thing. So in particular, I have our X plus L, which is the same thing for X plus. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna, I mean, I'm secretly thinking of them as the functions on the total space of a line bundle over X. So you look at the total space of L inverse, uh, that's a line bundle over X and then functions on this total space are what this coordinate ring is. Uh, Okay, so that's the setup. Uh, and again, I'm gonna specialize later uh, once we write down the precise theorem. Um, and in the setup, uh, the main theorem I wanna to explain today is the following. Um, and so, okay, I will call this, since I wanna to refer to this theorem later, when I try to unwrap it, let me give it a name. So I'll call it GCM, G stands for graded. So it's graded cohen macaulay -ness. Um, and the theorem, uh, maybe I attribute it to well, my joint work with Lurie, which I'll discuss, my own work, and also in this generality, uh, uh, we wrote down um, some statements in this uh, seven author paper, which is what most of this lecture series is about. So uh, do, if you want this general theorem for all excellent rings and not just finally presented rings, uh, then it's in the last reference. Okay, and then the theorem is actually very simple. Uh, the theorem is that, uh, the module, so over the homogeneous coordinate ring of X, the reduced mod P say, so the RXL module given by uh, the homogeneous coordinate ring of X plus reduced mod P is called Macaulay. Um, okay, and so why is this, why does this have anything to do with Kodaira vanishing? So there's this kind of standard dictionary, uh, which goes between um, the affine cone on a projective variety and cohomology of the projective variety. So understanding invariance of the affine cone, like its local cohomology is essentially equivalent to understanding cohomology on the projective variety. And cohen macaulay -ness is essentially the statement that certain local cohomology groups vanish. And so by this dictionary between local algebra and projective geometry, it gives you some vanishing of the cohomology of X with coefficients and powers of L. And uh, if you sort of go through that dictionary, you get exactly the statements I wrote down last time. Um, and it's just easy, convenient to package it this way as a single statement rather than a bunch of individual statements. Um, okay, so let me actually discuss some of this. So, so let's discuss some special cases. Um, oops. Okay. So first a uh, special case maybe is uh, when my, so I'm gonna make some assumptions on my base ring first. So here I said R was any excellent Ethereum domain. Let's just take it to be a field of characteristic P. And then in this case, this is exactly the theorem I wrote down last time. So if R equals K is a field of characteristic P. This is the theorem from last time. Um, so the case where R still has characteristic P, but is not a field. Uh, I, I mean, I think it was known uh, before, but somehow I don't think it was written down, but that's sort of not really the new part. Uh, probably the most interesting case uh, of this theorem, at least for at first pass, when you're trying to understand it is what happens when R, you take R to be just like a DVR. So you take a mixed characteristic DVR like ZP and uh, see what it tells you. So let me now try and spell it out in that case. Um, ah, sorry, maybe no, that's case three. I wanna do case two first, which I apologize, I skipped ahead in my notes. So, right. A degenerate special case is when X is equal to spec R. Uh, and R is an excellent Ethereum domain and X is just itself. So 
the wine bundle is trivial uh, and it's just a question in algebra. And in that case, uh, this coordinate ring is just a fancy way of saying R adjoint T. Uh, and this one, same thing over here is the coordinate ring of R plus adjoint T. And so in the special case, so if X is equal to spec R and L is equal to OX, then this theorem amounts to the following. Um, so I will drop the G because it's no longer a greatest statement now. So it's theorem CM. And this is the statement that R plus mod P is Colin Macaulay over R mod P. So what it's saying is that if you take any excellent Noetherian domain um, whatsoever, uh, the interesting case being the case where it's not of characteristic zero, then it's absolute integral closure has this kind of really nice Colin macaulay -ness property uh, when, you invert, uh, when you kill P. Uh, so maybe the first thing I should point out is that it's unreasonable to expect this theorem to be true in characteristic zero, right? In characteristic zero, if you start off with a ring, which is not Colin Macaulay, no matter what maneuver, like no matter what finite cover you pick over it, you're never going to produce Colin macaulay -ness out of it. The Colin macaulay -ness always survives. It's the same trace obstruction that I mentioned last time. And so you really cannot expect something like this without modding out by P. Uh, and the theorem is saying that once you do that, uh, things are fine. Um, okay, so maybe a little bit about uh, so this was actually the theorem that uh, I was hoping to prove when I started working on this project. Uh, and so this was sort of known previously in characteristic P. Uh, by work of Hoxter Hunicky in the 90s, and it was kind of a important theorem because it sort of it put together many different strands in the subject uh, into sort of a single vanishing theorem. Um, Or if the dimension of R is less than or equal to two, so actually this is kind of trivial, uh, just because in dimension two, being Cohen Macaulay is very easy. Uh, you're normal, if you're normal, you're Cohen Macaulay, and it's easy to make things normal by passing to finite covers. Or uh, dimension of R equals three in the almost category. So uh, this will make sense later in the talk. So this was a, a kind of a result of, this was a result of Heitman in the maybe 20 years ago now. Uh, it was uh, the first kind of breakthrough on uh, the direct sum and conjecture, uh, which is a problem in commutative algebra, which was recently solved in complete generality. And so the other thing I wanna say is that, right, this theorem CM implies a bunch of results in commutative algebra, which is not the direction I wanna go in in this talk, uh, but I should at least mention it. So this implies uh, what's called the direct sum and conjecture, which is the theorem of Yves Andre. Uh, there's a derived version of the direct sum and conjecture, uh, which was proven by myself, uh, which also follows by similar uh, arguments. Uh, there was also sort of this kind of big open question called uh, weakly functorial big Cohen Macaulay algebras. So basically, it was a conjecture of Hoxter uh, that any commutative ring whatsoever admits an algebra, uh, which is Cohen Macaulay over it. So it was some substitute for have like resolutions in some sense. Uh, and moreover, these uh, Cohen macaulay algebra should be weakly functorial in the sense that if you have a map of commutative rings, you can choose a map of the corresponding uh, Cohen macaulay algebras. And so this was proven by Andre uh, following up his work on the direct sum and conjecture and also by Gaber. Uh, their proofs are slightly indirect in that the algebras they construct uh, it's not so easy to write them down. Uh, you start with something that kind of works and then you massage it through some very indirect procedure like an ultra product uh, in one of the examples or some very transfinite construction in the other case. Um, and so what this theorem allows you to do is actually allows you to circumvent uh, those constructions because it just says you can pick R plus uh, or the p adic completion of R plus technically uh, if you want something over R uh, and that will do the job. And so it's useful for some uh, applications in algebra, but as I said, I don't really want to go in that direction in this talk. So let me let me just move on uh, to the case that I care about. Um, so, and that's the case of a DVR. So let's say R is equal to V, uh, which is a P complete, so P adequately complete and P torsion free. Uh, whoops. DVR and X over R, X over V, I guess, is proper flat of relative dimension P. 
So this is kind of the geometric situation. Like you're thinking, imagining a family of varieties over spec R. Uh, so here's X, here's spec V. Spec V has two points. There's the P equals zero point, And then there's the generic point theta. And here's sort of the generic fiber. Oh, sorry, here's the special fiber XP equals zero. And then the generic fiber, I will not draw in the picture. It's X eta. Um, and so in this situation, uh, this theorem uh, GCM, what it's saying is the following. So it's a combination of uh, three statements. Uh, and so it's actually very similar. It's gonna look very similar to what I said last time. So, so I'll call it theorem Kodara vanishing. Um, so it says that there exists a finite cover. Pi from Y to X, such that uh, pi upper star kills the following groups. So it's uh, the positive degree cohomology uh, of L, except you have to say P equals zero because there's a characteristic zero obstruction. So you can't literally kill all the cohomology of an ample line bundle. For example, X you know, could be like, uh, I don't know, a curve of genus two uh, over, over spec ZP. And then you can never kill it, H1s of certain ample line bundles. Um, the second is uh, the Kodara vanishing statement. So homology in degrees less than the relative dimension of negative powers, L inverse. Uh, and then uh, finally, there's a statement for the structure sheaf, which doesn't literally fall into the Kodaira vanishing setting, but it's um, extremely useful. Well, it does if you sort of allow this kind of semi ample and big generality, I guess. Um, and so this is kind of uh, exactly the same statement I wrote down last time in characteristic P. And what I'm saying now is that you can also do it in mixed characteristic. And so maybe one thing to emphasize is that you, you don't literally get this from the characteristic P statement, right? Like the, the finite cover you're producing over here lives in mixed characteristic. So if you had a finite cover that did the job over P equals zero, you might hope that that lifts to mixed characteristic, but that's actually not always true. There are lots of examples of varieties uh, in characteristic P that don't lift to characteristic zero and those could easily show up as one of these finite covers. So you really have to construct genuine uh, finite covers and mixed characteristic. And I'll comment a little bit on that later in the talk about where they come from. Uh, but I wanna sort of say a little bit about what this restriction means. So this might look kind of technical, like how do you actually uh, envision producing classes on XP equals zero? Uh, and it's actually very simple. So there's this, uh, I mean, there's a Bockstein sequence uh, as it's called in topology, which allows you to understand cohomology on XP equals zero entirely in terms of things on X. So maybe the remark I wanna make is that um, for, for all torsion free sheaves, F on X, you have a short exact sequence, which looks like so. So in the middle, I have this cohomology that I'm talking about. So the pullback of the sheaf to the P equals zero fiber. On the left-hand side, I have the cohomology of X itself with coefficients in F modded out by P, it injects. And then the quotient is the I plus first cohomology of X coefficients in F, and then rather it's P torsion. Okay, this just comes from the long, you write down the multiplication by P map on F as an exact sequence and then look at the corresponding long exact sequence. Uh, but so because of this, uh, this group has essentially two contributions. There are contributions of classes coming from X and it's recording whether or not those classes are divisible by P and there's contributions coming from P torsion classes on X. And so what the theorem is saying essentially is a combination of two statements. It's saying that whenever you see a class in one of these groups, let's say this one, you can only, sorry, whenever you, let's say you see a class in the cohomology of X with coefficients in L, uh, you can always make it divisible by P after passing to a finite cover. That's what you get if you just stare at this part of the exact sequence. And second statement is that whenever you see a torsion class in the cohomology of X, uh, you can always kill it by passing to a finite cover. That's what this part of the exact sequence tells you. So you can rewrite this statement over here uh, as is really six statements uh, about making certain classes P divisible and certain P torsion classes zero. But it's just more efficient to package uh, things this way. Is that okay? So are there, so maybe I should, I've been talking for like 20 minutes. So are there questions so far? Okay, sorry, can I ask? if uh, this GCN statement is also true mod P to the N for? Yeah, yeah, it is. And it follows formally from this one. 
oh, okay. just by because being Cohen Macaulay or is essentially a bunch of local cohomology groups vanishing. And the object mod P squared, for example, is filtered by two copies of the object mod P. And so you get some vanishing. If you have vanishing for the outer two pieces, you get vanishing for the middle one. Okay. Yeah, and in fact, so I didn't specify this, but maybe I should. Um, so you can pass to the inverse limit over here and actually get a p adic statement. So the statement would be that the p adic completion of R of x plus comma L uh, is actually a Cohen Macaulay algebra on the nose. So including after inverting P. So somehow the process of piatic completion gets around these obstructions that were showing up in KR60 uh, to Cohen Macaulay's. But uh, yeah, yeah. All right, so I, I wanted to focus a little bit maybe on, on, on this statement over here. Oops. So this is probably the easiest to palette statement. It's saying that whenever you have a family of varieties over a DVR, uh, and you have a coherent cohomology class of, of the structure sheaf, uh, you can always uh, kill it, or you can always make it divisible by P by passing to a finite cover. And moreover, if it's a P torsion class, you can always kill it by going uh, up to a finite cover. So part C. So this was actually known previously with finite covers being replaced by alterations. So it's a weaker statement that was known. Uh, whoops. So you have to allow yourself to pass up to generically finite covers rather than finite covers. Uh, but then the statement was exactly the same statement that was known. Uh, and so this was uh, stuff in my thesis, uh, but also balance and, uh, and this was both around 2011, say. Um, and so balance and the reason he encountered the statement uh, was he was trying to he was trying to give a very simple proof of the basic comparison results in piatic Hosh theory. So the analog of the Durham comparison theorem, or well, it is called the Durham comparison theorem, which compares Durham cohomology and singular cohomology in this piatic context. Uh, Bielensen gave a very simple proof of it. And one of the sort of key ingredients was what he calls the piatic Poincaré lemma. And the, the critical ingredient, the proof of the piatic Poincaré lemma was uh, exactly the statement that uh, these groups are killed by passing to alterations. Oops. Uh, over here. And so this purely kind of coherent cohomology theorem was used to prove results in piatic Hodge theory uh, back then. Uh, and somehow now, uh, already when you want to prove the stronger statement involving finite covers and not just alterations, uh, the proof, as I will try and say a little bit about later today, actually uses the full strength of modern results in piatic Hodge theory that were like, you know, proven last year. So things that were not available 10 years ago. So it's kind of a symbiotic relationship, I guess. Uh, and so maybe I should give an example at this point. So here's an easy example, which is maybe worthwhile. Anyway, so let's say X equals E is an elliptic curve over uh, my DVR V. And so in this case, uh, you can be very explicit about the kind of finite covers uh, you need uh, to kill uh, this cohomology group. And uh, what you need is, well, there are various choices, but the universal one that always works depending independent of the reduction type of the elliptic curve is the following. So then multiplication by P from E to E. So E is an elliptic curve, so it has a group law. And so you can multiply in the group law. In particular, you can multiply P times in the group law. And that is a isogeny. So it's a finite cover, uh, does the job for all three groups above. And so you have to convince yourself that this is actually true. But morally, the idea is that multiplication by P on uh, and any abelian variety, actually, uh, and it will act by also by multiplication by P on its H1 uh, of the coefficients in the structure sheet. And so if it's acting by multiplication by P on H1, uh, then it will kill this group uh, because in this case, there's no torsion. So uh, it's just about making classes P divisible. And more generally, the same argument will also work for abelian varieties. But already, I believe the case of uh, curves of higher genus is slightly unclear about how to proceed. And so if you're bored in the rest of the talk, uh, I recommend trying to prove this statement just for families of curves. Um, so I have a curve over a DVR, a flat curve over a DVR, uh, and try to find finite covers that kill the cohomology of OX. Uh, I don't actually know a very direct construction uh, if I don't assume the curve has good reduction. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Right. 
Okay, so let me keep going. So this was, I guess, I got my numbers confused. So I was doing special cases. This was special case uh, three, which was the case over DVR. Uh, I wanted to mention, uh, this is not quite a special case, but uh, it's sort of embedded in the proof. So a key intermediate result is the following. Uh, it says that this, it's exactly this issue that I was just alluding to. So the difference between finite covers and alterations. A priori, there could be a huge difference. Like for example, if you're working in Kirsig zero, you can make lots of things very nice if you allow yourself to go up along alterations, for example, blowups and resolutions, but you can't really make things nicer by going up along a finite cover. Uh, whereas the, what I've been trying to indicate in the talks is uh, away from Kirsig zero, the two can often be used interchangeably. And so here's kind of one precise theorem uh, to that effect. So this is uh, also, I guess, uh, in my joint work with Lurie. Um, so it says that for the purposes of coherent cohomology, uh, alterations and finite covers behave the same way uh, if you allow yourself to quantify over all of them. So let me just say it this way. So there exists a finite cover pi from y to x. Um, Oh, so maybe I should emphasize. So this is back in the general case. Meaning I'm, not, I'm no longer over DVR, I'm over arbitrary base. And so the statement is that there's a finite cover pi from y to x such that pi upper star from the cohomology of uh, let's say x with coefficients in OX mod P to the cohomology of y with coefficients in OY mod P uh, is zero in all positive degrees. Okay, so an example to have in mind of the setup is uh, I, I made no assumptions on the map from X to spec R. So X to spec R could itself be an alteration, right? So I have an affine variety and I have, for example, a blow up of the affine variety. Now the blow up could be an arbitrary blow up. So you could produce lots of interesting cohomology that way. And what this is saying is that all those cohomology classes can always be annihilated if you go up uh, to a further finite cover of the variety. And so I believe this, re this result is interesting already in dimension two. Uh, maybe there's an explicit argument in dimension two one can do by understanding uh, the structure of curves on an arithmetic surface, but it wasn't clear to me how to do that unless if like the curve configuration is sufficiently complicated. Uh, and certainly in higher dimensions, it's not clear uh, how to do it directly. Um, and so for the purposes of this talk, the upshot of this is uh, the collection of all finite covers and the collection of all alterations can be treated more or less interchangeably. So you may replace X plus uh, with the following object, which is the alteration version of X plus. I'll just write it the same way. So limit over all Y to X, where this is uh, an alteration now of Y. And so the difference between X tilde plus and X plus is that uh, you go up all the way to X plus. So you go, all up, go up along all finite covers you can go up along, but then you also allow yourself to do all possible normalized blowups after going up along those finite covers. So there are many more things that are allowed. Uh, and what the theorem is saying is that once you've already gone all the way to X plus doing those normalized blowups doesn't change anything. Uh, the cohomology remains the same. Uh, coherent cohomological purposes. And this will often be useful in applications because uh, alterations can be chosen to be smooth or regular, whereas finite covers cannot. And so um, we will use this actually in the next point. Um, okay, right. Uh, maybe before I write down the next point and have to scroll off the page, any questions about uh, what I'm trying to say here? Okay, and so let me now record a version of this uh, of this GCM theorem uh, that will be, I believe, be used uh, in later talks. Um, and so this is the dual version, which doesn't refer to uh, local cohomology secretly. So local cohomology is showing up in this Cohen McCollin assertion I was making, uh, and I'm now going to take a dual version, which is maybe slightly cleaner to parse. And so this appears. Uh, oh, so in this work of uh, Takamatsu and Yoshikawa, which I believe Sho will talk about on, um, well, in the next talk in the series, and also in our paper 
in the seven author paper. Uh, we we use this version, and so let me let me make a statement. So so say I fix a close point. So again, I remind you what the setup was. I had x to spec r. Uh, the target was an arbitrary uh, excellent Noetherian domain, and then this is just a proper dominant map. And then I had an ample line model upstairs, or seven ample index, sorry. Um, and so let me fix a close point uh, downstairs. Uh, and sorry, I guess I want to assume my points, like I want to be near characteristic P. Um, so let me fix a point off characteristic P. And so then theorem GCM, what it's saying in the Kodaira vanishing case uh, is the statement that uh, the cohomology in degrees less than the dimension of X with coefficient that support at the close point off X plus with coefficients in L inverse is equal to zero. So this is the, if, if you've seen sort of Kodaira vanishing in Kursig zero formulated in terms of local cohomology, then this statement might look very familiar. Uh, but I wanna sort of, un, I wanna get rid of the local cohomology. So let me start here and actually modify the statement. And so if you go through the proof of the theorem, so you need slightly more than what I've told you so far. So proof of theorem actually gives something stronger. So it says, if you just look at uh, the collection of these local cohomology groups for just the finite covers themselves that show up in the approximation where y to x uh, is um, finite cover. Well, actually, let me say alteration because I'm allowed to do that uh, through the maneuver I just explained in part four anyway. So if I just look at this collection of all of these local cohomology groups as some kind of a diagram, so as an end object, technically speaking, then this end object is actually zero. And so, okay, now you might think I made it like more complicated. I had a single group that was zero and now I've turned it into a statement about some end object being zero. But the reason this is useful is that the end object has more finiteness than its limit. So the terms of this have more finiteness. And so you can use that to uh, rewrite this uh, by using duality as follows. So if you use duality and maybe, okay, I'm probably assuming over here that R is local. Uh, I haven't, I'm not completely thought to this through right now. So let me assume R is local. So H bigger than zero of Y with coefficients in omega tensor L is zero. So this is the previous line was as an end object. And when you dualize an end object, you get a pro object. Uh, and again, I wanna go through all alterations and Technically, I should really go through all regular alterations. And so this is why this flexibility of going through alterations instead of finite covers was useful. Uh, and the reason that's important is that I get to put just the dualizing sheaf over here instead of some complex. Um, okay, and so this maybe could, should look more like Kodaira vanishing. It's saying that the cohomology groups of positive powers of the canonical twisted up by something positive are zero, but not quite on the nose because that cannot be true, but at least in some pro sense. And so it's this dual version that suggests that the following is a reasonable thing to look at. So here's a definition. It's, uh, we're calling it some kind of a mixed characteristic test ideal. Uh, it's basically, uh, I'm gonna write down whatever I didn't cover in the previous uh, lines. So over here, I proved that the positive degree cohomology groups vanish. And so it makes sense to talk about the H naught version of that. And that will have sort of good properties because the higher degree ones vanish. So I'll call this B zero. Uh, B zero of X with coefficients in omega tensor L is defined to be, uh, so it's gonna be, I'm gonna define a linear system inside omega tensor L. And it's gonna be the linear system of sections that lift to all possible finite covers or all possible alterations. So I look at all possible regular alterations, and then I look at the image of the trace map from H naught of Y omega Y tensor L to H naught of X omega X tensor L. So, so um, that, maybe you we call it B zero alt. Oh yeah, B zero alt, thank you, right. right. All right, and then there's a theorem that B zero alt is B zero. 
but yeah, to be consistent with what we did in the paper, let me call this P0 alt. And so these are sort of, so Carl had defined this linear system in characteristic P, which is called S0. And this is at least the first attempt at producing some analog of that in mixed characteristic. If you want the correct lifting theorems, uh, this is not quite literally what you do. You have to tweak it a little bit. But uh, I thought I should at least mention this because uh, some version of this will show up in the next talks. Um, okay, and so, right, I don't want to discuss this in this talk, uh, but I should at least, so, okay, so what is this doing? All this stuff is saying, let, let's assume that X is equal to spec R. So a lot of these complications go away. I'm just talking about a complete Noetherian local ring, let's say. I've defined this object, which is just associated to the ring now. So I'm assuming L is trivial. So I have a submodule of omega of the ring that I've canonically defined. It's a set of sections that lift to all possible alterations of the ring. Uh, it's an interesting submodule, but if, in order for this to be extremely useful, the same way that the corresponding notion in characteristic P is useful, uh, it's, you need one crucial property, which is you need it to be compatible with localization. So you want it to be the case that if you take your local ring, uh, go to a, localize at a non-pulse point now, and then complete there, and then define the submodule there similarly, then what you get is just the localization of the thing you had at the original pulse point. And so this is something that's sort of completely open right now. Uh, we don't have a good handle on localization. And I believe this is probably one of the most interesting open questions in, uh, in this direction. Uh, there are special cases we can show. Uh, so we, we, I believe we can show that it localizes uh, when you invert P. So that localization is okay. And that proof already uses like a lot of theorems in theoretic cost theory. And so I think this is gonna be some interesting further direction to pursue. Um, okay. Right, so this 37 minutes into my talk, uh, all I've done so far is I've told you what the sta original statement was. So let me maybe scroll back up and just go quickly go through what we've seen so far. So the original statement was that this kind of graded uh, version of uh, the coordinate ring, the graded version of the coordinate ring of the absolute integral closure rather uh, is called Macaulay. And then we sort of get special cases of that. So there was a special case when the ground field, when the ring was of characteristic P, which was last time's talk. Uh, there's a special case when X is just back R, and it's an interesting theorem in algebra. Uh, there's a special case of families over DVR, which is probably the most interesting geometric case. Uh, then there was this result that said that alterations and finite covers can more or less be treated interchangeably. And then we have this dual version, uh, which uh, you'll hear more about in the future talks. Okay, uh, are there any questions so far? Because I'm gonna go in a slightly different direction now. So. Meaning I want to try and tell you a little bit about what goes into the proofs uh, rather than uh, tell you more about this object. So if you have a question about this object, now is the time to do it. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about the architecture of the proof. I'm not going to give you the full proof. I mean, that would take like a semester or two. Uh, but I will at least, I want to so there are some interesting ingredients that go into the proof and I want to explain how they fit together. And so the, the, when you first start thinking about this problem, there's the following issue, which is to prove Cordera vanishing in Kirsig zero, uh, you have, or Kawamata Vivek vanishing and so on. There are lots of tools. There's Hodge theory and there's resolution singularities uh, and so on. If you want to prove it in Kirsig P, at least it's up to a finite cover version. Okay, you don't have Hodge theory and you don't have resolutions, but you have Frobenius. And you can play lots of games with the Frobenius. Uh, now, if you're a mixed characteristic, uh, you get stuck because you have neither. You don't have resolutions uh, and you don't have Frobenius. Uh, and so what I would like to do today is tell you how there are substitutes for, um, for those in ingredients uh, that fit together. So first thing I want to explain is why you can use the topology of the generic fiber to actually prove stuff about algebra and mixed characteristic, uh, which came as a bit of a surprise to me uh, when we first saw this happening. Uh, and then the second thing I want to explain is why there is a version of Frobenius and mixed characteristic. It's not obviously Frobenius, but there's some substitute which is good enough for uh, some applications. And so I want to explain some of the ideas. So the goal is to sketch, outline. So I've, I've just written two kind of wishy-washy words, so I should convince you that it's not going to be very serious. But sketch, outline, a proof of. Uh, what I called theorem CM earlier. So I want to specialize to just the algebra case where uh, one layer of complications kind of goes away. And moreover, I'm going to specialize to the case where the rings are nice. So instead of arbitrary excellent rings, I want to just restrict my attention to the finally presented ones. So say R is a finally presented 
the finite type uh, domain over the p-adic integers, zp. Um, and r to r plus is the absolute general closure. Um, and then the theorem is that r plus mod p is cm over r mod p. And so this is the goal. Um, yeah, there's not that much of a gap between the finite type case and the general case. Uh, I mean, there's some sort of sta fairly standard approximation arguments uh, using Popescu's approximation theorem that allow you to go from one to the other. And so this is, I mean, at least the way the paper is written, this is the kind of first case you have to prove and then the rest more or less follows. Um, and so there are two steps to the argument and there are two essentially distinct steps in the argument that only come together at the very end. Uh, and so the first step concerns uh, something that happens in Keresik zero. Um, and so there are two steps. Uh, so the first one is what I'm gonna call almost vanishing. And so this is gonna almost prove the theorem um, in a technical sense. So this is the part that's showing with Jacob. Uh, and so what we prove is uh, literally the same statement, but in the almost category. And since I'm not assuming that everyone in the audience is an expert in almost mathematics, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I'm gonna write down the statement. Um, so the statement is that R plus mod P is almost cohen Macaulay over R mod P. And so explicitly what this means is the following. Uh, for all close points of R, uh, so the cohen macaulay property of a module over a ring is the property that its local cohomology groups uh, vanish until you hit sort of the degree equal to the dimension. Uh, and so here, what I'm going to prove is not quite that they vanish, but they have a big annihilator. Um, so we have that uh, h less than d, so d is again the relative dimension uh, of x, at supported at x of r plus mod p. Uh, is almost zero. So what I mean is it's killed by all small powers of P. And so note that this is a statement that makes sense. So R plus is a ring, which is where all monic equations have solutions. It's a domain where everything has a monic equation has a solution. In particular, it has all P power roots of P. And so it makes sense to say that some module is killed by all P power roots of P. And the ideal generated by all p power roots of p is a huge ideal. It's not, it's not finitely generated. It's not generated by one element. It's some humongous thing. And so what this is saying is that this module has a big annihilator. Eventually, what we want to prove is that the module is actually zero. But the first step is to prove that it has this huge annihilator. And so this property of being killed by all small powers of p is, act, is what is called almost uh, being almost zero. So this is a definition that h less than d of x of r plus mod p is almost zero. And so this notion of being almost zero for a module over a big ring like this only makes sense in this heavily non Noetherian context, where you have these big ideals. Uh, and the reason it's useful to have these kind of infinitely generated ideals is uh, the collection of almost zero modules is gonna be nice. It's gonna be stable under extensions, for example. Uh, like if you just take an ideal and you look at all modules killed by the ideal, uh, if you have an extension of two such modules, the thing in the middle is usually only killed by I squared. It's not killed by I. But this ideal satisfies i equals i squared because it has all p power roots of p thrown inside it. Uh, and so what this means is that the collection of all almost zero modules is an abelian subcategory. And so you can ignore it uh, in some systematic fashion, which you can't do if the ideal did not have this property. And so this is the first statement uh, I want to explain. Uh, I wanted to say a little bit about the history of uh, what this terminology almost zero comes from, but maybe in the interest of time, let me avoid doing that. Uh, I, let, let me just say the terminology is due to faultings. Um, and so I said, I, I, I started off this section by saying that those, this was gonna be the characteristic zero part. And if you look at it, it doesn't look like it has anything to do with characteristic zero. Uh, and so here's how the characteristic zero comes in. And so it comes in via some kind of a Riemann Hilbert functor. So this is proven via the following. And so this is what we actually did, or this is what our project was actually about. So 
theorem RH. And so I have my X equals, so let me let X uh, denote the affine variety defined by uh, R, but not over ZP, but rather over the generic fiber, so over QP. But in fact, I want to pass all the way to the geometric generic fiber. So X is going to be uh, spec R phase change to QP bar. So this is some affine variety over uh, QP bar. QP bar is a field that's isomorphic to the complex numbers. So this is something we all know and love. Um, v is going to be uh, ZP bar, which is the integral closure. So it's the absolute integral closure of ZP. Uh, it's a it's a valuation ring of rank one, uh, just like the p-adic integers, but the value group is not discrete. The value group is Q, uh, so it's not Noetherian. Uh, and so you might think of that as a defect, but for for the purposes of a lot of stuff in p-adic geometry, this is actually good because the fraction field is algebraically closed, and the fraction field being algebraically closed means that a lot of the arithmetic complications go away. Like if you try to do stuff over ZP, you immediately run into difficult questions about the Galois homology of QP which disappear when you go up to QP bar. So this is a simplification. Um, and in this context, uh, our theorem is that there exists a natural functor, which we call the RH functor, which goes from uh, constructible sheaves on the generic fiber. So on this complex variety or QP bar variety with coefficients in FP. So this is a tau sheaves. And the output, so the input is something, is a variety that lives in characteristic zero, but the coefficients of my sheaves are characteristic P. Oh, whoops, sorry. Uh, I don't know what happened there. Is it working or? I mean, I just, I still just see the RH. Uh, let me just restart this. Sorry, on my screen it stopped showing, so I wasn't sure what I was writing. Uh, Okay, uh, I think it should work now, thanks. Yeah. Right, so the input uh, is a variety that lives over the comp over in characteristic zero with mod P sheaves. And the output is gonna be something that lives over my ring uh, base change to ZP bar. So R V bar, uh, R V, sorry. V was already V bar. So I took my affine variety over ZP and extended scalars uh, to uh, ZP bar. And then I'm going to simplify my life by modding out by the almost zero objects. Okay, so there's some connection between sort of the topology of the generic fiber and stuff happening on the special fiber. And really, since I'm doing mod p coefficients, it should be rv mod p. Uh, and so this functor has a lot of nice properties, and I can't get into all of them, but I want to write down two relevant ones. So. So the first property is that, why is it useful for us? Uh, it's useful because if pi is the absolute integral closure, then uh, this Riemann-Hilbert functor will take the push forward of the constant sheaf, fp, uh, to r plus mod p. So the thing I'm trying to prove something about. And this is a kind of a more general instance of a proper push forward compatibility of this functor. So like a lot of riemann hilbert functors, it's compatible with taking proper push forwards in either theory. And that amounts to uh, this statement over here using a small argument. So, so what this says is that if I wanna prove something about this object, it might be useful to prove something about this object and something about the functor RH. And so part B is uh, a property about the functor RH that's gonna be useful. So the property is the following. So if F, Inside, if f is a perverse sheaf on x with fp coefficients, then um, rh of f shifted by the dimension minus t rather is an almost cold Macaulay complex. So almost cm means that it satisfies the same local cohomology vanishings that a Cohen Macaulay module would satisfy, except it's now an object of the derived category. 
Um, and so I don't have too much time to explain what this is, but let me just say how we were inspired to find this. Um, so it's a CARE 60 motivation. So my, I, my understanding from watching lots of talks is that in Saito's theory of mixed Hodge modules, uh, he attaches certain coherent sheaves to uh, certain uh, constructible sheaves. And uh, if the constructible sheaf is actually a perverse sheaf, then the coherent sheaves he gets have good Cohen macaulay ness properties. And these depth properties are often useful in proving various vanishing theorems in Kersig zero. And so this is some version of that, uh, of that feature uh, in this kind of Kersig P coefficient setting. Um, and so if you just formally ignore uh, what all of these objects mean, but just stare what, what, what's on the screen. Uh, so I wanna prove something about this object. And what this theorem tells me is that RH applied to a perverse sheaf shifted by minus D produces something almost Cohen Macaulay. So I wanna prove this is almost Cohen Macaulay. And so it would be ideal if this guy was perverse and that's basically true. So it's not finite type, but it's an inductive limit of perverse sheaves. So using A and B, uh, theorem ACM, follows from the following lemma. So this lemma is that this constant sheaf pi lower star shifted by FP uh, and then, sorry, pi lower star of FP shifted by D uh, is an inductive limit of perverse sheaves, the direct limit. And this is really not that hard. Uh, if you know sort of the basic formalism of perverse sheaves, um, this is essentially the Arden vanishing theorem uh, in some souped up form. But it's slightly surprising because the analogous statement with Q coefficients is false. So this is only true with finite coefficients. And so this is an example of something that now in care six, you're working in care six zero, but you still see this phenomenon that since the coefficients are finite, finite covers behave in a slightly funny way. Um, and we're exploiting that over here. Um, okay. Right, so that was my attempt at sketching why the almost Cohen macaulay uh, of R plus, which is this statement over here, that this module is killed by all small powers of P is really a statement about the generic fiber. And it's really this statement about the generic fiber that the constant sheaf becomes perverse if you allow yourself to move up along finite covers. Are there any questions so far? Uh, I have a question. What, what is the uh, pth power of P? I thought that P is equal to zero. Sorry, where is the question from? Uh, it's, it's from the definition of almost zero. What is pth power of P? Well, pth power of P is zero, but one over pth power of P is not zero. So basically you're taking all new potents uh, of certain order? of all possible orders. So P has all P power roots. So there's a, this ideal of all P power roots of P is some huge ideal. Even though P is equal to zero, the ideal is still humongous. And I'm saying that it's killed by those guys. If, if, you may, if it helps you, okay. uh, you can replace, you can ignore the mod P over here. Uh, and the statement is still equivalent to the same statement actually. No, oh, uh, like saying that there, saying that like P to the power like one over something is a nil potent, I think it, it clears things up. Okay, great, yeah. Thanks. Right, yeah, I should have emphasized that, sorry, right. So this ring is extremely non-reduced. Uh, like if you go up to ZP bar and then go mod P, it's extremely non-reduced. And this non-reducedness is actually being exploited here. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, and so in my remaining five minutes, uh, I wanna briefly tell you how you go from almost vanishing to actual vanishing. So the almost vanishing, uh, which I just explained, uh, really only use stuff about the generic fiber. Um, and this was more or less the state of affairs like maybe two years ago, uh, no, one and a half year ago. Uh, and then at some point last year, uh, we realized that you can use uh, a new ingredient uh, to get actual vanishing. And so in applications, it's the actual vanishing, the honest vanishing that's more useful than the almost vanishing. Well, it's a stronger statement, so obviously. Um, and so this new ingredient is prismatic cohomology. And so I wanna just tell you why it's relevant here, not how it's relevant. So in Kersig P, um, in Ker P, uh, Hunicke and Lubeznik, they gave a very sort of simple argument uh, for this cohen macaulay a statement.
Uh, this was maybe like 15 years ago. So it was an alternative proof to the original Hoxter Hunicke proof, which was more, um, more element based. So this new argument was more cohomological. And essentially, it has two steps, which make clear what you need to do in mixed characteristic. So remember, the statement that we want to prove is the following. So the target theorem is that you have this Rm, let's say it's an excellent Noetherian domain. Oh, and now Yaku will complain that since I said excellent, I don't need to say Noetherian, but say lovey. Uh, and Fp is uh, contained inside R, so it's characteristic P. And so the target theorem is uh, the statement that the cohomology in degrees less than the dimension of R plus uh, supported at the maximal ideal is equal to zero. So this is the kind of local cohomology statement that you need to prove later in mixed characteristic, but I'm just telling you what they did in characteristic P. Um, and so what they do it is in two steps. So the first step, which I'll call HL1, uh, is the following observation that if you have a finite length submodule, which is stable under the Frobenius, then you can always annihilate it by a finite cover. So any finite length Frobenius stable, this is crucial, submodule inside the local cohomology of R can be annihilated by a finite cover. Uh, and so if you want to use this to prove uh, this statement up here, that the full local cohomology vanishes, you need it to be the case that the full, well, first of all, ideally, if the full local cohomology was itself a finite length Frobenius stable submodule, then you would be done. Uh, but that's not the case. But failing that, what you could hope for is that there's always a map R to S such that the image of the local cohomology of R inside the local cohomology of S has this property. Uh, and that's what they prove. So by induction on dimension, basically, it's not a very difficult argument. There exists a finite cover R to R prime such that the image of uh, H I M, well, no, H less than D, uh, M of R to H less than D, M of R prime has finite length. And so these two together imply the theorem because what the way you prove the theorem is you first find, you first take this R prime that comes from HL2. And then inside R prime, you have the submodule, which is given by the image of the local cohomology of R. And moreover, since it's the image of a map induced by a map of rings, it's stable under the Frobenius just by functoriality reasons. And so then you're in a situation where you can apply step one. And then step one says that you can kill it by a further finite cover. And so this is the argument uh, we want to mimic uh, in mixed characteristic. And in the interest of time, uh, I will just say the following. So in mixed characteristic, we mimic this argument. And since Frobenius plays such a crucial role, uh, we do the following. So we mimic this argument by replacing R with uh, what is called the prismatic homology of R, uh, or rather it's mod P reduction. And so in characteristic P, R has a Frobenius action. In mixed characteristic, R does not, but the prismatic homology always does. And so by making this replacement, you found some substitute for the structure sheaf in mixed characteristic that now carries a Frobenius. And you can attempt to run a similar argument uh, and then what happens is that part one works out exactly the same way. And then when you try to do part two, you get stuck because the, the, the difference between the prismatic cohomology of R and R, roughly this guy is a one parameter thickening of this guy. So the prismatic cohomology is an extra kind of arithmetic parameter. And this arithmetic parameter is necessary if you want to get the Frobenius action because that might not, not exist on R. And so when you try to do the induction on dimension, you also have to account for the arithmetic parameter. And so you sort of need to localize in the arithmetic direction and that part of the argument is handled by this almost called macaulay theorem that I mentioned before. So theorem ACM comes in in the induction and proving uh, this result at the end. Okay, I apologize. That took a little longer than I anticipated, but I'm out of time, so I've said what I want to say, so I'll stop. All right, let's uh, thank Bargo. Thank you. Are there... Any more questions? You should feel free to unmute yourself.
Yeah, uh, I have a quick question. Uh, so in this uh, HL2 or, um, or the, in the vanishing theorem that you mentioned at the beginning of last lecture, so you said mm -hmm. that it's not just enough to look at uh, finite maps given by Frobenius or the attaching PA2. So what kind of finite maps do you need? Well, all of them. So I don't know any intermediate, like you, well, one version of this question is that, I, so I'm proving this vanishing when you go all the way to R plus, but are there smaller subalgebras uh, yeah. that are still like big enough for the vanishing? And I don't know any natural such example. Okay. Didn't Anurag and, I mean, you know, they showed you could. Yeah, so sorry, Anurag, right. Sanai and Singh proved kind of the orthogonal statement that you can always use separable maps. So you, yeah. don't, you don't need the Frobenius. You can always use separable maps in Kirsik P. Um, and it was a very kind of simple idea that you per, if you perturb the equation slightly, things become separable and it doesn't change the local cohomology class. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a question about a small remark you made in the theorem, in the statement of the Kodaira vanishing theorem. You said that there could be many varieties which live which do not live to mixed characteristic and those could easily show up as finite covers. Uh -huh. Is that a precise statement? Do you know such covers which uh, do not live to mixed characteristic, which occur as the local cohomology annihilating covers? Well, not off the top of my head, but I'd, I'd be willing to bet money on it. Um, so was that a precise statement? The fact that I'd be willing to bet money on it? <laughs> Uh, no, so let me think. So uh, Remy went up into Broy and he gave an example of a variety with the property that no f alteration of the variety lives to characteristic zero. And so I suspect that variety uh, or any sufficiently big alteration of it will have to do the job. Because like, you see, if you have two, if you have one variety which does solves the finite cover problem, then anything above it also solves the finite cover problem. And you can always find something above it that dominates Remy's variety by taking some fiber product. And so then that other guy won't live. Okay, thanks. Any further questions? All right, if not, let's thank Margrave again. And I have a couple of very quick announcements. Um, the Gather Town thing should be open. The doors should be fixed. Um, you know, we'll see. Um, also, you know, uh, I got a couple emails about this. The videos are actually on the website. If you click on this, the lecture series, you can actually just find the videos there. Um, you don't need to log in to access them going forward. Oh yeah, I can send a link to the gather town. Absolutely. Um, I'll just post that here really quick. Okay, yeah, and the, That's right there, and the password is, um, you know, LaTeX your sheaf of one differentials or something. Um, in, in case you didn't come on uh, Tuesday, okay. Um, and we have our next talk tomorrow at the same time as today, and I hope we all see you all there. And stop recording.